Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Ken Levinson, the Executive Director of WIDA. I hope you are all doing well. Thank you for joining us today for what I believe is our 51st webinar panel since March. I guess if you all get our emails, you're not surprised we've had that many, but we're thrilled so many of you have joined us over the last seven months and again today. We have a couple events to tell you about in the coming weeks. Next Wednesday at 7 p.m., we're hosting a virtual trade community happy hour, cocktail hour. Uh, hope you will join us, chance to see some familiar faces and connect in a socially distant way with some old friends. Registration information for that event will be released shortly. Also coming up on October 28th, we're hosting the Trade Reporters again. This time we'll be joined by Anna Swanson from the New York Times, Bob Davis from the Wall Street Journal, and David Lynch from the Washington Post to discuss the election and what we might expect from a second Trump administration or a first Biden administration. Information on that event is in your event program and on WIDA's website, www.wida.org. For today's event, one of our favorite traditions is to call out a few of the names of the people you were in community with at the event today, even if you can't see them. So a hearty welcome to Sydney Stone with Alibaba, Sergio Gomez Laura with the Business Council of Mexico, Gleason Ryan with Chevron, and Dylan Sodaro with the Office of Congressman Bill Passarell of New Jersey. Thank you, Sydney, Sergio, Gleason, and Dylan for joining us, and thanks to all of you. We're delighted to welcome such a distinguished panel to WIDA today to discuss this very important issue that has gone literally from the back rooms to the front pages of the major newspapers around the world. I won't get into lengthy introductions of our panel as you all should have received a copy of their biographies by email earlier this afternoon, but I do wanna say thanks to Marcia, Kathy, and Sharon for joining us today, along with my good friend, the president of WIDA's board of directors, Steve Lamar, who's the president and CEO of the American Apparel and Footwear Association. Steve will moderate today's discussion. After the discussion amongst our panel, we'll take questions from the audience. If you're watching this on Zoom, you can ask questions using the Q&A tab on Zoom. We'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Thanks again, Marcia, Kathy, and Sharon. Steve? Great, thanks, Ken. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to moderate this impressive panel on what I think is one of the most important issues um, that we're just going to be talking about this year. You know, sadly, forced and child labor is all too prevalent in our world. Uh, our industry does not tolerate forced and child labor. It goes against our core values. It violates our foundational terms of engagement. And it's against U.S. law. Uh, many companies undertake a wide variety, wide array of activities to make sure these practices don't affect the supply chains. And, and we also deploy a wide array of measures to remediate these practices. We find them, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that later on. Uh, but these efforts are under constant pressure um, by those uh, individuals and, and entities and, and also governments um, who insist on enslaving and trafficking fellow human beings. So what we hope to do now is have a, a really good, solid, robust discussion about the scope of this problem and how U.S. trade policy is equipped and aids in our efforts to fight against it. Uh, so joining me today on this distinguished panel, and, and as Ken mentioned, we do have um, the bios and the information that's been, been sent out to you, but I'll introduce them now. Um, so Marcia Eugenio, Director of Office of Child Labor, Forced Labor and Human Trafficking at the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, Marcia brings decades of experience in both the federal government and at the ILO in, in working on these core issues. Uh, Kathy Feingold, Director of International Development for the AFL-CIO and Deputy President at the International Trade Union Confederation. Of course, Kathy has been a passionate advocate for workers' rights and is a frequent contributor to both the policy debates as well as the specific enforcement actions all over the world. And then Sharon Waxman, uh, President and CEO of the Fair Labor Association. Sharon has had a rich democracy development and foreign policy experience with organizations like the State Department, um, the Senate, and the International Rescue Committee. And we're pleased to note that my organization, AFA, partners with FLA in a number of initiatives to tackle forced labor. So I've asked Marcia uh, to kick things off, focusing on the recently released report um, that they've put out and explaining what some of its key findings might be and what they are. Next, we'll hear from Kathy to put that report into the trade policy context and also to talk about some of the specific trade tools that her organization relies on to combat forced labor. And lastly, we'll hear from Sharon uh, to share with us about some of the ways her, her organization and members lead on these issues and incorporate these tools and reports in their work on the ground. So Marcia, if I can turn it to you. 
Thank you so much. Good afternoon. And thank you to the Washington International Trade Association for the opportunity to participate in today's panel. I feel honored uh, to have the opportunity to speak with all of you about the work of the US Department of Labor, Bureau of International Labor Affairs in combating child labor, international child labor, forced labor and human trafficking. Um, I work with an amazing team of experts who are committed to ensuring a fair playing field for workers in the United States and around the world. Last month, uh, we released two of our landmark, landmark reports, uh, the ninth edition of the list of goods produced by child labor or forced labor. And that report is required by the Trafficking Victim Protection Reauthorization Act of 2005 and the 19th edition of the annual findings on the worst forms of child labor, which is required by the Trade and Development Act of 2000. As you can tell, we've been working on these issues for a while, just by the dates of those reports of when they were mandated. Um, our list of goods um, that I mentioned earlier contains 155 goods from 77 countries. Um, six new goods, um, rubber uh, gloves, rubber gloves, hair products, palm and stone fruits, um, sandstone and tomato products were added this year, as well as two new countries, Venezuela and Zimbabwe, in one new area, Taiwan. So a total of 25 new additions were included, and one good actually was removed, which is cattle from Nam Namibia. Um, these reports inform U.S. foreign policy, trade policy, uh, and cooperation initiatives. A theme that emerged from this year's report is from people commitment to active and quality enforcement. It has been 21 years since, 19, since 174 members um, of countries of the International Labor Organization unanimously adopted Convention 182 on the World Front to Child Labor. So 21 years ago, and in, in 2020, the small country of Tonga became the final country in the world to ratify this fundamental labor standard. So we were very happy about that. But one of the things that we know is that commitment on paper is not sufficient when at least 152 million children toil in child labor, roughly half of them in hazardous conditions. And they are also 25 million adults and children in forced labor. Governments need to take meaningful action, especially stronger enforcement efforts to effectively confront this problem. Our international child labor report covers 131 US trade beneficiary countries and territories. The report shines a spotlight on specific sectors in which child labor, including forced child labor and trafficking is present and the, describes the progress some countries have made in upholding their international commitments to eliminate these practices. I'm happy to report that this year, eight countries, eight countries Argentina, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Guatemala, Namibia, Paraguay, and Peru received the highest assessment of significant advancement towards elimination of the worst forms of child labor. Mexico is included in the report for the first time this year, following the entry into force of the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement on July 1st, 2020. The Department of Labor does not assess countries' level of effort in its first year, allowing the initial report to serve, to serve instead as a baseline. However, and I wanna mention this because it's not, noteworthy, that Mexico made meaningful efforts in all relevant areas evaluated by the report and would have received a significant advancement assessment this year. Of the more than 2,000 country-specific recommendations in the report, nearly 1,300 of them, or 62%, are directed at improving laws and enforcement. Holding those who violate laws accountable and providing adequate social protection, such as education, training, um, access to credit, are key to establishing a strong foundation of protection for vulnerable um, children and families. In addition to this report, and I will mention this super briefly, we also um, updated our app called Comply Chain, and it's a business tool for labor compliance in global supply chains. The Comply Chain app targets companies and industry 
groups that do not that do not have a social compliance system in place or those needing to improve their assistance systems for global production. We included more than 50 additional examples from businesses, business associations, companies, international organizations, and multi-state actors um, partnership among others. In addition, we now feature, feature legal, um, recent legal developments from around the world and further information about specialized topics. And these ones are important, such as conducting responsible recruitment to ensure hiring practices protect workers and empowering, empowering workers to speak out against exploitation. In addition to our research and reporting, iLab also supports technical assistance projects that build the capacity of government, civil society, businesses, and other partners to address child labor, forced labor, and human trafficking. We believe that partnership with governments, with businesses, and civil society are critical to creating meaningful change and combating child labor, forced labor, and human trafficking around the world. I look forward to talking more in depth about our research, reporting, and technical assistance in the discussion and Q&A portion of the program. Thank you so much for having me be a part of this panel. Great, hey, Kathy, if you could uh, pick up there, that would be terrific. Great, thanks so much, Stephen. Thank you, Dewita, and to all of my co-panelists for this event today. It's always so important to bring together the voices of government, business, labor, and NGOs to talk about how we can end forced labor together. And I wanna start with a special shout out to Marcia and your entire iLab team for this tremendous report that you've put together. And also I recognize that you this year have an expanded mandate, which is to examine not only the inputs to goods and products, but also the final goods and products made up of those inputs. And so I really wanna recognize the important work you do to informing us and, and the government. And I really want to start with that point, which is this report should be used as part of a whole of government approach to addressing forced labor. iLab, you do a fantastic job, but we need all agencies across the government to be working just as hard as you are. We cannot have a piecemeal approach to addressing a systemic problem. And yet at this moment, I would argue that our country has a piecemeal approach to solving this problem. And that sets a really challenging floor in the global economy where we continue to have these examples of forced labor that are outlined in the report. But I wanna ground our conversation today in the fact that this is about a, a global economic model that allows forced labor to happen. We, we have been seeing in the headlines a, a lot of information about the um, extreme case of forced labor in the Uyghur region of China. But I wanna be clear that this is not just about the Uyghur region in China. That is an egregious example that we all must be working on to end. But this is actually part of uh, an economic model that has allowed forced labor to happen. It's not just happenstance that so many people are in forced labor. It is about a set of policy decisions linked to an economic model that have been based on concentration of power and ownership, limited regulation, labor arbitrage, and soaring levels of inequality. We know that for the past four decades, there has been a model that has allowed all of these factors to come into play. And so I love this panel because we are really at a point where we need to say, we need a new economic model. The current model, and I think the pandemic gives us this opportunity to say, what is the model we can build to ensure forced labor is never again part of our economic model? So where you know we have these factors that contribute to a global workforce where the majority of workers are working for low wages, they have limited social and legal protections, limited access to decent work. We have the failure of governments. We have great frameworks. Um, we have international labor organization standards. Um, but often governments don't effectively enforce them and that becomes a huge issue. So we need to really start thinking about what are the new frameworks that we need, the new systems we need to address this. Um, so, this so despite all of the good uh, intentions today, I wanna um, talk a little bit about what is that new model that we need to build and talk about the tools that we currently have and the ones we need to create. So what are the tools, the trade tools that we have in the United States that we can use to address forced labor? 
The first one that many people are familiar with is the US Tariff Act of 1930, which clearly says um, that we can uh, not import into the US goods that were mined, produced, or manufactured um, in part with convict, forced, or indentured labor. Now, this existed for a really long time. And then something happened in 2015 that was really important because for many years, we actually said, you know what? Forced labor is okay in some circumstances. It is okay if um, there are quantities of a product in the United States that aren't available. Well, in 2015, after a lot of work by coalition partners, the unions and our allies, we actually got rid and eliminated the consumptive demand exception. So now Customs and Border Protection um, can have withhold release orders if they believe that goods are being or are likely to be imported in violation of this forced labor statute. A really important tool that we gained in 2015 to deal with forced labor. And it really said to the world, there are no exceptions left around forced labor. Um, we then have the generalized system of preference. We have all these trade preference programs, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Again, they talk about international labor organization standards. It includes forced labor. Um, but uh, in, in 2017, the AFLCO actually filed a complaint against Mauritania under AGOA for forced labor. And benefits have been suspended for not just forced labor, but slave labor in that country. So that's an example of how we use a tool so that our government can engage the government of Mauritania, use our benefits in a trade program to hopefully end the, the practices of, of slave labor. Um, we also have the Uyghur Forced Labor for Prevention Act. I know Sharon's going to talk a bit more about this issue, but again, these types of legislative actions that are really important to saying that um, you cannot, uh, U.S. imports which come from that region, from Xinjiang region, China, which are produced by Chinese suppliers um, or may have been part of a pairing program, um, are prohibited. So another example of a regulatory framework that the AFL-CIO is supporting along with a, a lot of our allies. A couple more, um, and then I will turn it back to Steve. We have the uh, USMCA, which I think is really innovative. Marcia spoke about it, the Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force that's being established. It's going to be an interagency tax task force between uh, Border Protection, uh, uh, Labor Department, USTR, State and Commerce to look at the Tariff Act to see um, how we can improve around transparency in dealing with forced labor. There are some other ones, but let me just quickly touch on the other global tools that we have. We have the United Nations Guiding Principles, obviously, International Labor Organization Forced Labor uh, Convention, and the OECD guidelines. The problem with all of these really great frameworks is they are not binding. They are not enforceable. If you break a rule, there is no consequences. This is why we keep having rules broken because governments and businesses alike feel like there are no consequences for breaking the rules around forced labor. So they provide really good guidance, but the next step that we need, and I think this is about building the new model, is building my models that are binding and enforceable. There is a consequence. And lastly, I would just say there are many other countries around the world, from the Netherlands to, the, to Great Britain, the UK Modern Slavery Act, many other countries. I think there's been 55 um, countries looking at some sort of due diligence or laws addressing forced labor. Um, the United States government should more actively take a role in uh, working with allies. We need one common framework to talk about forced labor. It's not enough if we block forced labor in the United States, we need uh, the rest of the world to do the same, to, to join us in saying uh, it is not okay. So, you know, where labor law is effectively enforced, where businesses face consequences and penalties if they're caught using forced labor, forced labor will be eliminated. That's the kind of approach we need to take. And I look forward to working with all of you to make it happen. Thank you. Great, thanks, Kathy. Very, very emphatic. Um, Sharon, um, if you're up, you can uh, take us home and then we'll start our uh, conversation among the That's great. Thanks, um, thanks, Stephen, and thanks also to WIDA for hosting this uh, panel discussion. It's a really important topic. Uh, for those of you who may not know the Fair Labor Association, I thought I would just introduce us very briefly. Uh, we are a multi-stakeholder initiative. We're a nonprofit organization. We were um, established 21 years ago, and we bring together three different constituencies, uh, labor rights organizations and civil society organizations, U.S. universities, 
and companies to work together to find solutions uh, to systemic labor uh, challenges and violations. We work with um, over a thousand international brands and uh, companies that are committed to uh, respecting workers' rights in the global supply chain and are well aware of the, you know, the challenge of forced labor and are really, are truly committed to uh, eliminating it from the supply chain, uh, you know, in an environment um, that's, you know, complicated, murky, and where governments either don't enact laws, enforce them, uh, and where they are, um, you know, responsible for, for the, the practices in, in their own companies and in the, the, the facilities where they manufacture their, um, their goods. I'm going to tailor my three minutes um, with your indulgence to those in the, in the group who may not know what, you know, what we're talking about when we're, when we're talking about forced labor, you know, what does it look like? You know, what is it that you see on the ground? Um, and I think of forced labor, you know, in, in two different buckets. One are, is the kind of forced labor, and they're both, they're both terrible, um, where the situation can be remediated and the other more easily remediated, and the other that is really state-sponsored and you know, much, much more challenging. So in the, in the case of the, the first, um, you know, the, the ILO has outlined and described 11 indicators um, to identify forced labor. Um, you know, these are, I wanna be clear, these are signs they're, and they're clues, but they don't necessarily mean a definitive finding of forced labor. Uh, you know, we talk to companies and they say, well, how do, you know, how do I know forced labor? What does it look like? And I think part of the challenge with forced labor is that sometimes by the time the worker shows up in the factory or on the farm, they're, all, it, they're already in a situation of forced labor, so you can't really see it. So what do I mean by that? You know, there are, you know, of the 11 indicators, there are, you know, there's debt bondage, there's uh, restricted movement, there's retention of passport. Uh, and in some cases, you know, in Malaysia, for example, um, and it could be Malaysia, it could be Jordan, it could be Thailand, it could be anywhere in the world, but you'll have a worker who's been recruited by a recruitment agency, they don't have a contract, they believe that they are going to Malaysia or country, you know, any country to um, engage in a particular kind of work, their contract, they get there, it turns out they're, they're doing something completely different. Their passport is confiscated. They have paid recruitment fees uh, to the recruiter because they believe they have to pay to get a good job, which is not true, but this is you know, what they believe, it's what they're told. So they end up in a factory and they're already in a forced labor situation, which makes it harder to, um, to detect. Uh, so when that kind of, when your companies or whoever whoever it is that you're working with um, through WIDA, when you find that kind of situation, those those can be remediated. You know, in the case of Malaysia, the factory that I mentioned, you know, the factory worked out an arrangement where they paid um, back wages, they paid the workers who had paid recruitment fees and made them whole. They gave them their passport so that they could move freely and not be you know in violation of uh, you know, ILO standards and, um, you know, and they can, you can change a housing situation. So those are, you know, while terrible, you know, the kinds of, reme of forced labor that can be remediated. The other kind, and you know, Kathy you know, alluded to this, is what we're seeing in China, which is a whole different uh, ball of wax, you know, where it is, systemic, it's state sponsored, it's state imposed forced labor. And you know what really makes China different is that the government controls all aspects of the Uyghurs' lives. Um, so in this case of, of forced labor, you know, this is why we say that prevention uh, is just super, super important. A lot of the reporting has rightly been on the apparel sector. Um, I think it's, it, it's really important to remember that it's not only apparel, it's electronics um, and it's you know, agriculture. Everyone uh, with operations, sourcing operations in China is um, at risk of being complicit in 
these really horrendous um, human rights abuses. Uh, you know, I think most of you probably have seen the list of WROs, certainly some on apparel, some on hair, uh, one pretty recently on computer parts. And, you know, I think the broad point is that all parts of the supply chain really are, are at risk. Um, you know, it can be cotton, it can be yarn, it can be fabric, it can be a computer part, you, you know, you just, you don't know where it is until you really do the tough work and the detective work of tracing the supply chain and really knowing where the, the commodity and where the product is made. Um, Kathy, you know, rightly focused on section 307, um, which puts the burden on the importer to know where the, the goods are, are made. Um, and again, the, the standard is, you know, in wholly or in part. So anywhere in the supply chain, uh, you know, it, it is a risk. Um, I have some, you know, very concrete, you know, ideas about how companies, what they should do, what they shouldn't do. Steve, I don't know if we have time to go through that now or if we want to come back to that, you know, in the Q&A, but I would just say that to, to add to what Kathy said about sort of taking a whole of government approach, you know, I really couldn't agree more. Uh, there is a lot of focus on the WROs and the trade angle, which is, you know, really appropriate. Um, but those are not the only tools that our government and all governments have to address this issue. You know, there is diplomacy. Our State Department ought to be raising this at every opportunity with their counterparts in Beijing and also our allies across the globe. It is a shared uh, a shared interest and, and the government, the Chinese government really needs to understand that, that the international community is um, united on this. And while this is a human rights issue, it's also clearly a, an economic issue and it really should be a part of those conversations about economic issues. So while the trade tools are you know, important, um, they're incomplete. And uh, you know, it, it really needs to be, if we think of it as a multiple choice test, it needs to be all of the above in order to really uh, change the dynamic and see some, see some results on this. Great, hey, Sharon, well, actually, while you've got the floor then, why don't, if you could give us maybe a couple of examples, you said you've got some of those um, do's and don'ts, maybe I think we've got time for maybe uh, just one or two of those, I think will be really helpful to illustrate um, some um, of the stuff on the ground. Yeah, so I mean, I think one, boy, that's really hard to sort of pick pick a couple. Uh, but I would say, you know, one thing, um, you know, that's, that's really, really important is that you not to rely on audits. Um, you know, due diligence in Xinjiang is just not possible. Uh, there's too much surveillance. Um, there's too much political repression. So anyone who thinks that an auditor is going to be able to go into Xinjiang and give you a clear picture of the labor situation is, I think, really um, sorely <laughs> mistaken. Uh, it's just not. It's just not possible. We've advised our affiliates, you know, for our, since last January or before, you know, don't rely on um, don't rely on due diligence in Xinjiang. Outside of Xinjiang, you, it's probably you know you can still find auditors uh, who can give you some information, but look, audits are a snapshot in time and they're, you know, they're not the solution, um, but that's, you know, the first don't. I would say the second really, you know, big do not do is don't, you should be really careful about using um, government employment agencies and employment services. And I say this because of the, the, the Uyghurs are caught up in a much bigger economic policy uh, where the government is trying to um, entice investment into Western China and use uh, inexpensive labor uh, to Eastern China. So it's kind of like a sister city program. This is where you'll hear about the pairing program. So the government, they have these arrangements where uh, these cities will be paired uh, with Xinjiang. And what happens is that, that Uyghur labor through government agencies gets caught up in the export of labor and it's trafficking. So, so you wanna be really, really careful um, about not using government agencies because 
you know, there's pretty good, you run the risk of, of being involved in trafficking. Um, you know, the other side is obviously you want to be, you know, be super careful and really not, uh, not be sourcing from Xinjiang. Uh, you know, we've told our companies, you really need to start looking for other um, sourcing destinations. Obviously it's complicated, you know, sourcing relationships build up over, you know, over decades. Um, but, you know, I don't, no company really wants to be complicit in these kinds of horrendous human rights abuses, nor should they be. Um, so those are a couple of the don'ts. Um, I have a whole list of do's, but we'll come back to those if we have time. Sure, thanks. And and um, Kathy, Sharon was talking a little bit about the um, um, sort of the all of the above, um, sort of the multiple choice question. Um, when you, and and I thought it was a really good um, difference between sort of those kinds of forced labor that's able to be remediated and those that can't. Um, another way you might sort of divide that up is forced labor that is state sponsored and that that's not. And you talked about the, the array of tools we have. Are, are some tools better than others for tackling different kinds of, of manifestations of forced labor, whether it's state sponsored or not? Maybe you could talk us through a little bit of that. Absolutely. Thanks. And I just want to be clear that I think that all kinds of forced labor need to be eliminated. So right, right, right. for the record, um, you know, those that are, you know, have different levels, I was talking about remediation. I think all forced labor needs to be eliminated. But, um, you know, I would say all the tools are, are incomplete. Um, the Let's go back to the, the Uyghur region, the Xinjiang um, question, which is basically is a state sponsored, right? Um, it's, uh, looking at one ethnic group. Um, and, uh, you know, the tools that we have is, uh, uh, the AFL-CIO is putting forward, we have differences of opinion on this, is a region-wide uh, withhold release order just to make sure, because you can't do due diligence in the region, um, that, it, you know, we effectively target that region. Um, what we have learned and from state-sponsored is it's extremely hard, unless that state, um, you know, it, moral shaming, is a is a challenging strategy. We've tried that with other with other governments, and so we think an economic strategy um, that undermines the economic model um, that is benefiting from forced labor is how you go about even addressing the the state sponsored um, forced labor labor model. But you know, just to say, I think we're all we're all acknowledging that the tools that we currently have. I mean, you see that some were created in the 1930s, right? And we've been it took us this long, it took us till 2015 to update it. Most of them are not fit for purpose. Most of them don't really get at this point of consequences. Um, most of them offer some nice guidance. And so what we really need to do is take the tools that we have and really look at the current world we're living in to, to address both the, you know, the corporations that are violating and, and using forced labor and the states and figure out what are the new tools that we need to uh, agree to? Like, I think at the WTO, we've been saying for a long time, you wanna hold states accountable, you get labor rights conditions and, and agreements there. So I think there's lots of places we still have room um, to build some new tools that would deal with both the state sponsored as well as consequences for uh, corporations. Thank you. And, and Kathy and maybe Marcia too, um, one, of the, one of the big changes, of course, you, you both alluded to this, was the removal of the consumptive demand, the, the reforms long overdue to, um, uh, to, to update it from the 1930s to 2016, 2015, 2016, so just a few years ago. What, what's happened in the last five years um, using those new authorities? Do you think there's been um, some noticeable improvements? Have they been used effectively? Um, I mean, Kathy, obviously the, the work isn't done, but what have you seen? Can you comment on some of that so far? Marcia, do you wanna go first or would you like me to go ahead? Um, sure, I mean, I, I, I will come in and then turn it over to you. You, you, you probably have a um, slightly different perspective from where you are um, in terms of how to look at that. Um, I will comment that just as we were talking about the, the China situation and the Uyghurs in the region in Xinjiang, that I, um, you know, the, the, the U.S. government um, has taken a, a, a very uh, intensive um, and concerted effort um, to address um, the situation in China. Uh, you know, from Kathy, you mentioned the State Department. Um, in the Department of the Treasury and CBP and DHS. I mean, this really in, in the Department of it, there's really 
a big effort to to try to address that as one as, as one government as, as a whole of government um, and we believe that the situation is is absolutely horrendous i mean it's bad enough to have child um, forced labor that is um, uh, you know it happens as part of the supply chain kind of situation maybe a traffic situation it may be because of recruitment issue or withholding of a passport it's a completely different situation when you're talking about state sponsor um, for slaver. And the one example that I have where we were able to kind of, um, as a community and including the government, where we were able to address this somewhat in a success, successful way is Uzbekistan and cotton. And I think that that presents a, a, an important example or a useful example. I mean, it's not at the same scale uh, and the, in the, the conditions are slightly different than in China, but it does present a good example of where, where a government commits itself to try to um, address a, a situation where they actually do take step, where they do bring in the international community, where they bring in um, independent observers, where they actually welcome assistance to try to remediate the, the problem that you actually do get positive results. So. We, we, we will use all the tools at our disposal to, to go to, to, to address what we see in China. Um, and just to add one more tool that, that Kathy in, in her very extensive and comprehensive list of tools um, didn't, didn't mention was the one, the one that was missing in there is the responsibility for governments to actually do responsible procurement. Um, the United States States government, as, as far as as well as UK, Canada, and all other governments, um, are big uh, purchaser of goods. And, and, and as governments, we also have responsibility. And the US government has been a leader in this area um, since 1999, actually issuing a, a, an executive order saying that we, as the federal government, will not procure goods made with forced child labor. Um, and some of those other additional procurement regulations that were issued after the passage of the Trafficking Act. So just taking a minute to talk about that, the WORO process in, in the Tariff Act, um, I, I won't speak for my colleagues at CVP, but I, I do want to acknowledge the challenges that, that, that they also have in terms of information and gathering information. And this is where all of you who are out there, uh, whether you're a member of a company that is actually doing the right thing, or uh, an advocacy group that wants to see change in the ground, being able to, to collect information and provide that information in a way that is useful for enforcement efforts is very important. And this is where we can come in and we can kind of advise and say, you know, this is the information that is needed. Um, CBP has, um, uh, you know, the changes since, I think that I've, I personally have seen a difference in the approach that has been taken since 2015 to now. Um, I see um, uh, the efforts and the, the increase in WROs, um, processes had to be put in place to actually be able to implement the changes in law and to be able to act on it. And yes, there's always room for improvement, but I, I, I do believe that there is a, a, a real desire to be able to, to, to address that, the issue and to use that tool as a tool um, for, 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 trying to get sustained and, and significant change when it comes to the issue of forced labor. And it is a deterrence. Uh, the, the many conversations that I had with governments about like, well, if you put us on the TVPRA list, does that mean that we're, CBP is going to be issuing a WRO? I, I, if I had a penny for every one of those conversations, I would probably have like, you know, uh, I don't know, $100. But the, but the point is, that um, the, the question is the wrong one. I, 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 when people are asking, how can I get off the list? Or why, how can I not have be, have be the subject of a WRO? You're asking the wrong question because the question that should be asked is what do I need to do as a company or as a government or as a civil society to actually change the conditions that lead to forced labor? And this is where Kathy and both Sharon has, have already spoken quite a bit about those conditions. So I'm gonna leave it at that and happy to answer um, additional questions. Thank you. Great, I know that Sharon had a comment that she wanted to, um, to talk to on that as well. So. Yeah, Kathy, did you wanna go ahead or? I'll jump in after you, go ahead. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think the other, I mean, it, we, we talk a lot about the, the WROs and governments, you know, taking responsibility and completely agree with, you know, that whole conversation. But I, I, I feel sometimes like what really gets lost in this conversation is that this is a, uh, a government, a Chinese government policy that can be changed by the Chinese government. And, uh, you know, business industry, you know, you all have a lot of contacts and connections, you know, having worked on trade policy for, you know, for decades, you have relationships with counterparts uh, in, in China. And, you know, I would say that, you know, we're going to continue to do what we do from the US, from the government side, you know, from an advocacy, a campaign side, and all of that is really helpful. But probably the, this one of the single most important things uh, that industry can do is use your relationship, use your contacts, and go to them in China and, and explain to them why this policy is so toxic for, for the Chinese government and why the policy needs to change. Because, you know, we should be clear, you know, the policy was enacted, it's been really, you know, ramped up since 2017. And it can and it can change. That's hard. I know. I'm not. You know. I'm not naive, but I do think it's a really important uh, tool in our in our toolkit um, that we really ought to be using and keep our eye, you know, on the ball that the government can change the policy. So I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> Maybe I'll just make a couple of uh, comments to close on the WRO question. And, um, you know, I, 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 on Sharon's point around China, I think we need a whole nother we to conversation around China trade policy because um, it really gets to that question that I think the model that has been built between the US and China makes that just, you know, talk to the Communist Party quite challenging and, and people are, are a little scared of China and all of their economic interests. And that's what has made this whole whole moment so challenging because sharing you're right it is a policy that can be changed and so how do you leverage it whether through a WRO I think the um a couple in response Steve to your question around the WROs and sort of CBP and how have they changed I think there has been an increase you know we saw very few WROs since the 1930s and now we have seen more you know uh, WROs coming out um, a couple things recommendations we would like to see in terms of improvement um, clear guidance on what kind of information they need to go after a case. It takes a lot of work for allies to put cases together. So we need clear guidance. What information do they need? Transparency and transparency. Uh, publishing on their uh, website, uh, you know, uh, you know, how are they enforcing it? What are they doing? It's very hard to find out information. So therefore, as you know, allies and, and civil society organizations, it's hard to know what is actually um, happening. Um, and then, you know, we need more resources. Um, our position is not necessarily blanket resources for CBP because they have other um, mandates, but for this particular mandate, um, section 307, they need increased um, resources so that they can really increase enforcement in high risk areas. They know where those areas are. They're linked to Marcia's report. So let's connect the dots and really help them go to the regions where there are the biggest problems. Yeah, and I think I think those are some you know really good pieces of advice, especially um, kind of brings back to your comment about the whole of government approaches that you know there's great information in Marcia's report. Um, CBP has some tools, some of the, those tools have been improved, but there's still a lot of work to be done. I I just give a shout out to the um, the COAC, the Customs Operations Advisory Committee, which has made a number of recommendations. Um, and uh, you can you can find recommendations they made over the last couple of years that talk to many of the ones that Kathy's made about, you know, um, you know, guidance, clear evidentiary standards, transparency, um, communications between the trade, the uh, CBP, um, and uh, and all the stakeholders, labor unions, NGOs, and also the resources. So there's a um, really good, sound recommendations that. Um, you know, perhaps is this uh, fair labor, uh, um, forced labor task force is working um, through um, some of the work they can be, you know, tackling some of these things too, and perhaps looking at that as well for this, as you mentioned, the whole of government approach. I see Ken's come back on, so I think that's his cue. He's, I think you were going to take on some of the questions that have come in from the audience and, uh, and, uh, yes, and uh, moderate those. Thank you, Steve. Hold on. I'm not sure if my mute is on. Hold on. Well, I can hear you. 
Oh, you can hear me. Okay, good. I can't. My mute button disappeared from my screen. I apologize. Um, so uh, we have some really good questions that have come in. I want to take the first one. Um, and if folks, if you're watching this on Zoom, please use the Q&A tab to send in some questions. First question I want to take from Tom Schomburg. Tom's an old friend of WIDA and me, um, is one of uh, the, the world's leading lawyers and Washington's leading lawyers on Section 337. He asked about the role of Section 337 to assist in uh, dealing with the forced labor issues. And wondering, Kathy, maybe if that's a question you could tackle for us. Absolutely, and I think we, uh, the AFL-CIO actually submitted some comments about this. I was trying to remember, it was probably a couple of years ago, um, where we do believe that, um, uh, you know, this is an unfair um, competition, um, that when you have, uh, when you're competing with forced labor, uh, you're not competing, right? And so um, in um, uh, some comments we make to the ITC, we, ITC, we absolutely argue that um, this is an unfair uh, labor practice, it's unfair competition. And so I do think um, that that could be used. I do think there is a role for the IT, ITC in that. Great. Um, Nicole Bivens Collinson, uh, who, again, uh, someone who may be well known to some of you, you know, want to know what is the role that companies play or should be playing in in governance of these of countries that we're doing business with? You know, is that a role for business? Maybe Steve, that maybe is something. Um, maybe your thoughts on that might be ones that that we might want to hear. Your mute's on, Steve. Sorry about that. You know, we've been we've been in Zoom world for ten months, and we're still learning where the mute buttons are. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think you know look, companies companies are exporters of values. I mean, we we take our values um, not just against um, forced labor, but um, all forms of um, you know promoting good worker rights, good human rights, uh, economic development, um, and we um, we. Um, circulate those values all over the world, you know, through, as through the trade we, we, we take on through the, so through the supply chains we do. So we're providing not just jobs, but we're providing um, good examples. And, um, and so that's, that is obviously not going to replace what nations should be doing or what government should be doing and sort of the discourse that needs to go on, but it does provide good um, private sector examples. Um, we also partner around the world with a lot of NGOs and labor unions and, you know, Kathy's group and um, Sharon's group and others um, that can go on and on that a lot of our members use and, and work with. And again, that, that kind of, of NGO company partnership, um, union, NGO company partnership, union company partnership, any variation of that is an important model to show um, governments how proper civil discourse works. So we often find ourselves good players in bad neighborhoods. And, you know, I think that's an important role that we can play in addition to the jobs that we're creating. Okay, would, you know, and then this is a question from Marcia. I mean, any of you, I guess, um, it comes from Kathleen Black with Coca-Cola, um, wants to know, you know, she's glad to hear about an all of the above recommendation for how to address uh, the forest and child labor issues. Are there some particularly good concrete examples of places where iLab is partnered with business and civil society to remedy a situation of forced labor? Um, well, one of the examples that I um, mentioned earlier, I think Uzbekistan is it's a particularly helpful one because I, I think that that is um, an example where um, a lot of the community and a lot of the people who are, are who are are in the panel and that are probably joining us um, kind of joined together to, to decry was, was a situation um, that was unacceptable. And there was a lot of engagement, a lot of diplomacy through, through the U.S. government. There was a lot of efforts through USTR, through the Department of Labor, working with the ILO, um, working with, with groups here in the United States that were very, very active um, in that issue. And, and the, the factors there that actually work were um, the government changing, hope, hoping the government get to a place where they could recognize that there was a problem and they could change that policy, um, looking at how they were going to do that, making sure that there was monitoring, be, being able to monitor and measure progress, um, and be able to, to kind of provide tools and resources to address the issue. 
Um, there have been other examples, <clears throat> excuse me, where we've worked with, with companies. I mean, we actually worked, it wasn't a forced labor issue, but we worked in a, in a project with the FLA in Turkey um, where we were working on um, hazelnut production and looking at the supply chain. We have a number of different um, technical assistance cooperation programs all over the world that are looking at, at, at the issue of what are the best um, interventions. But I would say that at the end of the day, it's not a, a project or a, a one tool. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole set of, of actions that are going to make the difference. And where it is a situation of um, forced labor um, in the supply chain of a company, for example, a lot, a lot, and I, I hate to say this, governments cannot be everywhere all the time. Um, as much as we would like to, and we say that government need to, to enforce the labor laws, that's not going to get us where we need to be. There is a lot of informality in a lot of sectors where there is a lot of pro production and the forced labor, child labor may be actually uh, down in the informal uh, part of the supply chain. And it is the responsibility of those that are kind of operating in the more of uh, part of the formal sector of that of that sector to actually take action. Um, and we have a number of different examples um, that are included actually in the report that we put out that we can talk about, including sugarcane in Panama um, and, and others that we've actually, where we looked at the issue of how to remediate child labor and forced labor in, in, a, in the supply chain of a sector. So thank you, Marcia. Um, we have an interesting question from Jeff Snyder, and he asks about um, there are audit reports that he's that, that have been done for operations in Shenzhen, and um, you know, is is it the best response for a company to just leave? Is that the best thing for when they when they see these violations, or you know, is that could that potentially be harmful to the workers if the job and opportunities go away? I, Kathy, happy. please. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for the question. And I think, you know, St. John really is an extreme example um, where you cannot do due diligence. You cannot do due diligence in a place that is a complete surveillance state where workers cannot freely um, talk to you about what is happening in the workplace. So that is the real issue here. In other places um, where, where workers can talk to you and tell you about what's going on in the factory, in the workplace, that means you can do due diligence and really assess what's happening. In this situation, it has been shown um, that they can't do it. And the social auditing firms are actually acknowledging they cannot get these independent um, invest, you know, uh, interviews with the workers. To the second point about when the, you know, isn't it just better to stay? Um, we always have the, the take that we listen to the stakeholders and the affected communities. The Uyghur community has said publicly and in a testimony that Steve and I were just in that they believe that the right thing is for companies to leave because the current model does not help the Uyghur community and the, um, the ethnic Muslim communities that are there. So in this case, they themselves are asking that the companies leave. And so we are supporting um, their request. I think the Uzbekistan model that Marcia has referenced a few times shows what could happen down the road because now we're in a situation in Uzbekistan where we're creating a new model that says, how do we come back in? How do we come back into a country that has changed, right? And, and that how do we ensure that we build a new system in Uzbekistan that's a new one? So in order to get to that place in, in the Uyghur region or Xinjiang, what we need to do is we absolutely need to end this economic model. There is no piecemeal approach to this. There is no let's wait and see. Um, it is a complete surveillance state and workers have no right to um, speak out against it, to change their situation. Um, and I think, you know, if you're gonna change the Chinese policy, it is gonna take that economic pressure. Yeah, and actually, Ken, if I could just um, jump in there. Or and Sharon, did you want to say something? No, actually, you go Sharon. ahead. Go ahead, Steve. I was going to say one of the things that, and, and, and that's certainly the conclusion a lot of people are reaching is um, that there really is no choice but to leave. But, but I think to the questioner's point is that you do, you, you do run the risk of harming other people that were benefiting from, you know, from the economic activity that was not um, connected to forced labor. And that's why we go back to that same point of um, it really is, um, you know, looking at changing the underlying problems, the forced labor, the campaign of oppression that it fuels is really gonna require, that's gonna change when we get the, 
you know, the U.S. government engaged at, at the high level and at every level of engagement. We can bring other allies to the table in a very consistent, clear, unified message. And that's, that's the thing that's really missing right now. And that's the thing we need to make sure actually does happen um, and happen very soon. Yeah. Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say that there are, you know, I, I take the question a little bit more broadly. I mean, in, in terms of, um, you know, leaving when you find forced labor anywhere in the world, I would say, you know, the answer is no, if it can be remediated. If there is an issue within a supply chain that is, you know, fixable, then, you know, our approach um, would be to work to, you know, to fix the immediate problem and change whatever policy in the corporation or the relationship with the company and the manufacturer contributed to creating that um, circumstance. I mean, that's a slow process, but there are problems that can be, that can be fixed. But again, to, but to Kathy's point, in the case of Xinjiang, it is so, um, you can't change, you can't remediate uh, a systemic problem of you know, forced labor where a million people are being uprooted you know, and, and separated from their families and their children and sent into uh, prison camps, forced labor camps. And you mean that is, <laughs> that's not remediable you know, factory by factory. That requires government change. So, I think the, you know, the answer is that it depends. Um, and, you know, in Xinjiang, I, you know, as I said earlier, we've told our companies, you know, almost a year ago that you can't, you can't do due diligence in there. Don't rely on an audit. Uh, I've seen audits coming out of Xinjiang. I'm sure Kathy's seen them as well. I know Steve has, and, you know, they're really not worth the paper they're written on. So uh, be careful. <laughs> So um, we got just a minute or two. Want to hit a couple quick, quick questions before we go. Uh, Nicole Bivens Collinson had a second question about uh, the linking, you know, the, the question of federal U.S. federal prison industries, and how do we look at that in this context? Steve. Um, well, just very quickly. I mean, federal prison industries is, in our opinion, forced labor, and I think um, we have a higher moral ground in in um, enforcing forced labor. Um, um, fixing forced labor around the world when we do a better job at home. Great, uh, thank you. So, and one other question, and this is maybe a little bit of my own um, lack of understanding of this, but um, Matthew Schaefer at the Yider Institute at the University of Nebraska asks about custom sharing between various customs authorities. Is this a, a step that could be done that would help facilitate or, or the ability to combat forced labor? Is, and I don't even know, is that something that's in the, the WTO's trade facilitation agreement? Is that something that was ever addressed there? I'm not sure if anyone knows. Kathy? Uh, I actually don't know if that's in the WTO. I would just say it would be great practice. And when I think about the USMCA as a new model that's being created, I do think that the governments of Mexico, US, and Canada will be in discussion around the forced labor piece that is in the USMCA. So that might be a place where we start building that model where there is, um, I mean, it would seem silly not to share information, right, that our customs right. folks are finding. But I actually don't know, and I would leave that to the CBP to, to, um, to address, but I think it would be a best practice. And I'm not the CB, I'm not obviously with CBP, but I will say that I, I, I know that CBP does have conversations with our other um, governments, um, custom agencies, so. Oh, very so, yeah. good. Well, thank you all. Um, we've kept you right to the bewitching hour. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Marcia, Kathy, Sharon, and Steve for joining us today. Really grateful. Uh, it couldn't be a much more important topic that WIDA could address. Really appreciate all of you joining us today. Thank you very much. We will continue to follow up on these issues, all the things that were brought up today. Um, at our future events and look forward to hearing more from all of you. Thank you all for your questions. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Everybody, please be safe, take care and wear a mask. Thanks, Ken. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks.